Clifton. Um, I'm going to be talking about horror in Seneca's play Oedipus. Um, thank you for staying this long. I won't keep you too much longer so that you don't have to gouge up your eyes. <laughs> um, so when I was writing this paper, one of the problems that I was confronted with was the depth with which one can really uh, study this play. Um, so I really had to focus my efforts and uh, sort of zero in on one aspect of it. So one thing that really stood out to me was the, um, the elements in it which truly horrify us and frighten us and disgust us. Um, and that just so happens to line up with many of the parameters of the horror genre, which is conventionally defined as a genre which intends to frame disgust or startle its audience by inducing feelings of terror and horror. Now, what are terror and horror? I always thought terror was just a synonym of horror. Like, when I was saying horror too much, I right-click it and uh, select terror as an alternative. But in reality, there are two different things. A good analogy is um, when a character hears something in their kitchen at night, and they hear it and they start to move towards the pantry. What we feel is terror, that anticipation of what could happen. But when she opens the pantry and whatever pops out, that's the horror. So it's two different things. And you really need both to be part of the horror genre. And I found that these two elements were definitely present in Seneca's play. I'll uh, read the opening lines to it to get the feel. Now, with night banished, the sun rises reluctantly. It shines gloomily, rising amidst a noxious haze. Bearing its sad light and grievous flame, it looks upon homes, gutted by a greedy plague and the light of day reveals the destruction night has wrought. Seneca brings forth an apocalyptic vision of Thebes. Um, this is an appropriate way to begin a work of horror, as it's obviously a problem that some of the characters are going to have to deal with, in this instance, Oedipus. And it not only establishes the dismal mood of the play, but also offers the story's first clues to Oedipus' fate and future events in the play. And the <coughs> night being banished alludes to Oedipus' own future blindness and banishment from Thebes. And also the concept that the sun is hesitant to rise at all is a conventional omen of disaster. Also, the idea that the sun is reluctant or uh, doubtful in its rise really also expresses the many types of doubt in the play, as Oedipus feels doubt towards, him, towards himself. And uh, he's not sure about the nature of what really is happening. And unknown to him, but not the audience, his patricidal incestuous crimes have upturned the entire cosmic order. I'll read for you what he first says concerning what he feels is uh, the major issues that are confronting him. I fear the unspeakable. My father killed by my own hand. The Delphic Oracle warned me of this and announced another greater crime. Is there any crime greater than patricide? O oh, cursed love, I'm ashamed to speak my fate. Apollo threatens a son with his mother's bed, incestuous sheets and impious bedside torch. The idea of a paranoid, victimized Oedipus crops up again and again in the play as he characterizes himself as someone who is assailed not only from without, but within, it's truly uh, a psychologically disturbed Oedipus, uh, which is also a common element in the horror genre in general. Because even more threatening to Oedipus than the plague is the truth, the truth about his crimes, 
a truth which threatens to destroy his family and nature, and worst of all, his own identity. He then transitions from describing his own anxieties to describing the uh, state of nature around Thebes, which is truly upended, to say the least. Uh, he says that no warm winds come to Thebes anymore, but the plague bringing southerly winds do instead. All vegetation has drowned and died, and the rivers dried up, and a blight has struck the fields. The harvest withers upon the stalk. The faint sun, already mentioned as rising amid a haze before, barely even shines anymore. And the night sky is starless and shrouded in that same haze, which now is a dense black vapor. To us, these lines may seem, yeah, they're apocalyptic, but if we really look at it from the perspective of an ancient, they're much more apocalyptic than they would appear to us. At night, when we look out of the sky, we don't see any stars anymore. But that's one of the consequences of living in a modern city. But back in the day, in the evening, unless it was unusually cloudy, one could look at the sky with wonderment and see all the stars and how they would correspond with stories and myths and things like that. Even if we do go up north and look at the stars, yeah, whatever, there's stars. They're there. We have experts who are like uh, well versed in uh, their movements and all that, but they don't really have any bearing on our lives, whereas for the ancients, this was not the case. So for the sky to be perpetually starless would certainly be a frightening spectacle. Oedipus goes on to say that a hellish appearance has settled upon mankind. He goes on to tell how a sick father and mother lug their dead son away to the pyre, and then they hurry back to grab another one because there's not even enough wood to create two pyres for the two sons. The sons need to share a pyre. Uh, this idea of a destroyed family once again sort of foreshadows Oedipus's future, his own destroyed family. This uh, apocalyptic setting, an innocent human life being relentlessly threatened by natural forces is a common theme in the whole genre, as is the destruction of families. It's actually a subgenre called family or the destruction of the nuclear Family. The beginning of Seneca's Oedipus is quite different from its older counterpart by Sophocles. The beginning of Sophocles, it talks about the plague and it talks about sort of the issues that are confronting the Thebans, but it's much more hopeful. And Oedipus is presented as a caring, pious king, speaking to the Theban children and a priest of Zeus. Whereas, as I said before, in this play, Seneca is deeply paranoid. He's also paranoid of Apollo. He feels that Apollo has cursed him. And there's a difference because in the earlier Greek play, it sort of begins like a true tragedy. Oedipus is sort of up here, and as the play progresses, he's launched sort of deeper and deeper into uh, despair. Whereas in this play, he's already in the midst of his misfortunes. He's not quite at the bottom yet, as we'll find out. But there's no real fall from grace that is typical of a tragedy. So it's actually led many scholars to wonder whether this is even really a tragedy at all. As Aristotle felt this element of fall from grace um, being critical to the tragic plot. So after this first act, there's a chorus, and a chorus usually sings a song, often pertaining to what's happening, sometimes not. But in Seneca's case, there's always some kind of overlying theme, and it's usually directly attached to what happened before. So in this first choral ode, often called the plague ode, 
um, the scene of how to play is devastated in most glorious thieves. The chorus says of the Thebans, we fall ravished by a vicious fate. To describe how the people form long columns funneling through the seven gates of Thebes to go to their own pyres, to their own deaths. They're essentially waiting for their own deaths. However, the seven gates aren't even enough. There's too many people waiting to die that they start to get jammed on top of one another, dying on top of one another. Even the boatman on the river Styx is exhausted from ferrying people back and forth constantly. The chorus describes in detail how the people die horrible deaths. First, their limbs become lethargic, their faces flush, spots appear on their skin, and they come down with fiery fevers. Then their eyes bulge with blood, freezing their stares as their bodies waste away. Their ears are constantly ringing and black gore drips from their noses as their veins give way and burst open. Their bodies quake with constant screaming. This is a pretty vivid description. He goes on to say that multitudes of people flock to the altars not to pray for salvation, but to pray for death. There's, there's a substantial difference between this choral ode and the one in Sophocles' version. They also do mention the play, but it's much more hopeful, and there's not this graphic physiological description typical of the horror genre, which permeates Seneca's version. The second scene I'm going to look at is the ex despicium, the uh, examining of an animal's entrails. Um, we don't really do this nowadays, um, but back then it was it was considered a good way to foretell the future, to know um, if what was supposed to be done was the right thing to do. Um, and it wasn't only these sort of superstitious things of opening up an animal, but it could be as, to say the least, interesting as feeding a chicken and seeing if it'll eat it. There's a famous story before a battle in the First Punic War where uh, before the Romans were going to engage the Carthaginians, they, the Romans decided to feed two chickens, sacred chickens, to uh, see if they would eat it. They didn't eat the grain, so the battle could not proceed. But the general wouldn't have any of that, so he threw them overboard said, if they won't eat, let them drink. Of course, the Romans lost the battle. He threw the sacred chickens overboard. But this goes to show you that the Romans truly believed in the veracity of uh, these practices. So as I describe sort of what happens in this examining of the entrails, to us, it seems like a foreign procedure that we would never see in real life. But to them, most people would have had some sort of knowledge or even intimate knowledge with these proceedings. So for them to go awry in any way, it's a big deal. So first, what they do is they burn incense and they sort of examine the flames and the smoke. And bad omens are already arising. The flames dance about and they split in two. And they sort of are hostile to one another. This is clearly a reference to the future hostility between Oedipus' two sons, Ictiocles and Polynices. Uh, hostility which evidently continued even after their deaths, as in other literature, the uh, fire rising from their shared funeral pyre also split into two. Um, the people who are performing this uh, examination of the entrails, they, uh, one of them is a priest named Tiresias, and his, but he's blind, so he's unable to really do it, but he can sort of 
interpret it. It's actually his daughter, Monta, who's the one sort of doing the dirty work, so to speak. But um, as she's doing it, as they pour the wine onto the sacrifice, it turns into blood. And the smoke that comes off of it circles around Oedipus's head, especially his face and his eyes. Obviously, as we can guess, wine turning into blood is not a good omen. It's also present in Seneca's other tragedies. Um, in Thyestes, uh, Thyestes, uh, his children are sacrificed by Atreus. By Atreus um, and their, the smoke coming from their bodies um, is also like cursed, and the wine turns into blood there as well. Um, but one other sign from the wine is sort of circling its Oedipus's face that also represents his future blindness as well. This play has all these sort of foreshadowings and symbolism. Through every, almost every paragraph, there's one or two things that kind of foretells Oedipus' future, which is certainly interesting to us, but it would also be interesting to the audience as well, because just like us, they would have known sort of what direction this play is going in. They don't believe that it's going to be a happy ending. Um, so then the next part of the next dispicium is the actual dispicium itself. It's where Mancho sacrifices the bull of the hamper. Right from the get-go, the animals are acting strangely. The bull sees the light and he shrinks away from it. Once again, sort of the light being the truth and his shrinking away from it, sort of the abyss's future being horrified by the truth. And the heifer just willingly goes to the land. It's almost like a suicide, which is interesting because that is what will happen to the abyss's wife, Jocasta, who, spoiler alert, is also his mother. But then Monto begins to talk about how the blood flows from sacrificial victims. And that's when things get pretty horrifying. I'll read my translation of it. Monto exclaims, the blood pours out of the heifer like a river through a hole in her breast. The bull's deep wounds are flecked with low droplets. Now great streams of blood are turning back. Flowing backwards, they erupt through the bull's mouth and eyes. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> Even in a modern horror movie, that would take many of us aback. We would find that simply horrifying to an ancient audience, not deluged with these types of materials and uh, sort of other works of literature with these things. It would have been even more horrifying. When Monto holds up the entrails for examination, instead of sort of quivering like they should because the animal is just slaughtered, so they're kind of still alive with the, uh, with the organs. Instead, they're shaking violently. Blood spews out of them, and the veins are black. And when she looks at the heart, it's diseased and withered. The liver is spewing black bile. And uh, many organs are missing, and the ones that are present, they're not in their right places. The lungs are bloody and on the right side of the chest, and the heart's not on the left side either. Mantra claims that nature has been inverted, a theme already seen to be prevalent in Oedipus before when we were talking about the actual state of the firing. Now, here, evidently, the insides of the animals have also been inverted and ruined by, uh, by Oedipus' actions. However, a horror scene involving examining the trails would not really be complete without discovering a fetus. 
And then the heifer coming back to life and attacking them. And that's exactly what happens. Mancho exclaims, these hacked torsos are trying to get up. This gaping corpse is rising and is lunging at us. The entrails are flying out of my hands. Everything starts going pretty wild. Um, and there's not a lot of predecessors to this part of the play. Before, when I described the, uh, the effects of the plague on the Thebans, there are some literary predecessors. Um, Lucretius in his De Rerum Natura, um, he talks about the effects of plague and how their stairs are frozen and their eyes bulge with blood and they, it's not fun at all. Um, and also in Thucydides in his uh, history of the Peloponnesian War, he also describes the effects of the plague, the Athenian plague, which came back and back again three times, I believe, killing many Athenians. And Thucydides also talks about how people pack shrines, keeping on top of one another. So there's predecessors for that, but for this, the reanimating heifer, an attacking person, essentially a zombie cow, it's, there's no real there's no real exact predecessor that Seneca was working with. Instead, he took many ideas and sort of brought them together to create this work of world. But when Mondo discovers the fetus, despite the heifer being unmated, so like there's no way she could have a fetus. Um, this is also a reference to you know, this is a natural relationship with Joe Casca and his offspring. Obviously, her being his mother, that's not really the conventional family dynamic. Not nowadays and not back then. But as I said before, the heifer groans and the limbs begin to move. And in fact, both the heifer and the bull come back to life and try to get up. This uh, graphic description by Seneca of uh, ex despicci gone wrong begins to move the play into the realm of what's called visceral horror, a genre, a sub-genre of horror, which focuses on graphic, unnatural transformation, degeneration or destruction of the body. Themes such as decay, disease, and mutation are prevalent. And uh, they certainly are present in this case. As I said before, to an ancient audience, as with the stars in the sky, but also here with the Exodus Picium, they truly believed in the truthfulness that these things could foretell the future, they could, they could tell about the present and the past. They were truthful. Whereas to us, we sort of place our belief in science. And because of that, we sort of ignore a lot of these phenomena. Whereas to them, this was science. This was cutting edge, literally. So for these procedures to go wrong would truly be horrifying for anyone in the audience, especially for a potential reader who is alone in the dark at home. The final scene of uh, the play that I'm going to talk about is also the final scene of the play. It's uh, this is self-blinded, and uh, as can be expected, it's uh, pretty messy. So once he just discovers the truth about the nature of his marriage and his family and all that. He's obviously not too happy about it, and he returns to his palace and wishes to die. First, he wishes to be stabbed with steel or fire or crushed with a rock, or perhaps his guts torn out by a bird or a tigress, um, or maybe torn apart by beasts or even rabid dogs, whichever's worse. 
However, he feels these punishments aren't even appropriate for the crimes he's committed. He feels that perhaps maybe for the killing of his father, but not for the incestuous relations with his mother. And there's this sort of twisted sort of connection between him discovering the truth and seeing the truth. So he'll remove the organ from his head, which made him see the truth. So he decides to tear out his own eyes, a process which Seneca describes in graphic fashion. His eyes throbbing as he gouges them out with, claw, with clawed hands. His hands cling inside the holes in his head, tearing at the empty cavities. Once he's ripped them out, he rolls them out together, and his eyeless holes in his head scan the tracks of that heaven. And then he gets the eyeballs, and the nerves are hanging off, he plucks them off. It's disgusting. <laughs> So disgusting that even the messenger, who's actually reporting these events to the audience, says that Oedipus does all this with pointless rage and fury. It's just too excessive. Like, why the nerves? He can't even see them. Like, it's just over the top. But it's definitely effective in causing disgust. I remember in class when we were reading this section, I had just gotten a uh, laser eye surgery <laughs> like three weeks before. So, uh, and like, I'm not gonna dissuade any of you from like getting a procedure. It definitely worked. I see it all very clearly. But for a couple hours afterwards, it definitely feels like something bad happened to your eyes. So when we were reading this, it was like, I could feel it. And that's the idea how when in a work of or we'll see someone's limb get bent the wrong way, or their finger gets bent sideways. We can feel that. That's the goal of it. So clearly Seneca is very effective in doing this. And as I said, one of the intents of horror is to cause revulsion. And uh, not only are there a lot of revolting scenes in this play and body parts, and graphic descriptions of plague victims. But all this is happening sort of unnaturally, often having a sort of supernatural quality about these things. Mutated organs foretell the future, an abnormal fetus epitomizes the main characters, and a slaughter bull and effort rise again. These are scenes meant not only to frighten the audience, but also hint at several sort of aspects of the story at the large. Although grotesque imagery involving death, gore, and the sort of reversal of the natural order is not uncommon in Seneca's other plays, in Oedipus, these themes are pervasive and amplified. As such, I feel Seneca's Oedipus is the earliest piece of Western literature which can be considered part of the horror. Thank you very much. is um, a couple major differences between our modern day horror genre and um, a tragedy like this is first of all that um, like when we're watching a horror movie, like you said, we know that it's going to end badly, but we don't actually know how it's going to end badly and what's going to happen, whereas um, Seneca's audiences would have already known um, how the story would play out. And then second of all, when we're watching a movie, we can actually see like all the horrifying stuff that's happening. Whereas, as you alluded to, um, a lot of the horrifying content in these tragedies is like reported through messenger speeches. Um, and we don't even know if these plays were even performed in the first place or if they were just written to be read. So um, I guess I'm wondering, do you think these factors pose an additional challenge to Seneca? And if so, like, how does he deal with them? How does he manage to still make it horrifying, um, despite the fact that like we already know how it's going to end, and um, we can't really see any of the gore and stuff like that? Well, some, I'll address the second 
question first and then go back to the first one. The second one was about uh, perform, etc. Um, if it was not performed, and it's this this uh, more of literature could have been consumed privately mm -hmm. in one's own quarters, um, that would, if anything, amplify the effect of the horror as opposed to sort of diminish it. Sometimes when people are strutting around on stage, there's not as much of a suspension of disbelief. Whereas when you're reading the material, your sort of imagination can take hold. Um, and then the first part where you said how the audience uh, sort of knows how this would play out, that certainly was a challenge that Seneca would have had, but he had some latitude because um, Jocasta didn't necessarily have to die. There are other plays where she is alive um, by the time her two sons are battling it out. So he sort of had the option. So the sort of signs that may be pointing to her suicide and all that, a reader would not know if she was going to kill herself by the end. Obviously, they know he was going to kill himself. But other than that, certainly have been allowed to do it. I think that answered it, at least. Thank you. So I had a question about genre. So like the so you made some allusions to like the differences between the Sophocles play and the Seneca play. And what's interesting is that I know that in like sort of like classical tradition, all often scholars kind of like to scoff at Seneca's version and like Seneca's Thyestes as well as kind of being like over the top and like kind of being like a worse play. But I, I really appreciated your like more earnest analysis of it. Um, because I think the difference is that a lot of people read Seneca's tragedies as tragedies, and I think that the sort of different genre framing of it, like of horror, sort of makes it, like forgives it a little bit for being over the top and for like having the kind of like changes that a lot of scholars like don't like and sort of like seeing the merits in them. So like, for, for instance, like not starting Oedipus off on this like very like grandeur scale or like the zombie, um, sacrifice or like um, the actual gouging out of Oedipus's eyes. I think in the Sophocles, um, he takes two brooches from Jocasta's um, like clothes and like, yeah. just pokes them out rather than this like yeah. very visceral. It's not like, quite as. It's, yeah, it's not as like gross. Um, and what's interesting is that like, it's really a question of genre, I think, because um, if we're reading this as a horror, then all of that makes sense. Whereas if we're reading this as a tragedy, or as some people even like to read the Sophocles as like the original whodunit, um, like the whole um, anagnorisis, the whole like, um, what's the word? I forgot the word, but like the whole um, realization scene and the whole um, fall from grace, it all um, makes sense to happen in like more of a subtle context and ra rather than like Seneca's all out horror. So like, I was just wondering like, do you think, do you sort of agree with that sort of reading of like, your analysis that making this a horror forgives it a little bit? Absolutely, and that was one of the obstacles that I had even writing this paper, as a lot of the previous scholars who uh, sort of addressed this really just condemned it as just like a gore fest, just pointless, over the top, whereas I sort of just tried to look at it from the other way around sort of see that as part of its purpose, as opposed to sort of a byproduct that was not intended but ended up happening and should therefore be condemned, if that makes any sense. Yeah. I'd also like to, sorry, just quickly challenge your last sentence because I thought that was interesting you mentioned it was like the first work of, of horror. Um, I actually attended like a really cool talk where someone argued that Euripides' Back Eye was, the, was a, a work of postmodern horror. So I don't know if you wanted to look into that a little bit. It was all about sort of like the subversion of expectations, which you talked about quite a bit. So that might be like an area to like further analyze if you um, wanted to sort of challenge your idea that this was like the first horror. Absolutely. Um, it's often cited as uh, being a forerunner of the genre, as is uh, the werewolf scene satyricon, but with that, it's simply just an episode within an episode, it's sort of like isolated, so that's not really a thing. Whereas your example 
Um, I would imagine that if you looked at it closer, it is not quite uh, as permeated with all these themes from start to finish as I was able to read the opening lines and the ending lines and nearly every scene in between involves one of these themes. Whereas I would wager that that is not the case in, uh, in the backgrounds. Why don't you look at it? <laughs> talking about the sacri the audience reaction to perverted sacrifice. Um, so this is the whether if this was not in fact performed, yeah, and perhaps even if it was, it would have been directed very much at an elite literary and philosophically educated audience who might not who we often think might not have taken sacrifices quite so seriously. There's a Cicero passage where he uh, talks about this, and a lot of philosophers, I think, had doubts about whether sacrifice really and omens really functioned the way popular traditional religion said they did. So I wonder how you think that would change the audience reaction to it if they did not necessarily fully believe in well, if they don't fully believe in omens, then that's one thing, but I guess I can just give an example. Like, when we watch The Exorcist, we don't believe in, I don't believe in exorcism, but I'm still right. Just because we don't necessarily believe in the veracity of kind of what's happening on screen, on screen, it doesn't mean we can't be, uh, affected by sort of what's being conveyed to us. But of course, if they did believe in these things, that that would just amplify even more. But it's not necessarily uh, required to sort of be frightened or affected by what Seneca is telling us. Thanks so much.